of Straight Talk from Israel. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. Well, 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 sovereignty, sovereignty. What's the difference between annexation and sovereignty? Israel is going to be, God willing, on July 1st, according to the government uh, and the reports, is going to be applying sovereignty on different parts of Judea and Samaria, the biblical homeland of the Jewish people. And what uh, what is the difference between annexation and sovereignty? What exactly is going to be done? We're going to be speaking with Nadia Matar in the first part of the show today, and she's going to be talking about that. Also, um, we're going to be talking with somebody who is going to teach us today how to organize. Now, whether you're Jewish and making Aliyah, or you're not Jewish and you're just listening in to the program from, any, for, from anywhere in the world, you're going to learn, hopefully, some tips today on how to declutter your home, your room, your closet, whatever it is she's going to be talking to us about today. Because there are so many people today that are now thinking about making Aliyah or moving to Israel, but they just have too much stuff. Where are they going to put it all? I mean, when you come to Israel, you usually downsize. You go from these big, beautiful houses in the United States to a three or four room apartment. It's much smaller. So what do you do with all the stuff you have? Well, this uh, woman is an expert organizer, and she's going to be giving us some tips on how to declutter and not let our things keep us in a golden cage, keep us prisoners in our homes, keep us prisoners in our old lives and not let us expand into the beautiful butterflies we are supposed to be. All that's coming up on the show, um, I want to remind you all also to check out our uh, our homepage at israelnewstalkradio.com. There, if you click on our red button that says listen now, you can listen to our live broadcast. It'll take you straight into our chat room. Hi to everybody in the chat room right now, and hi to everybody listening from all over the world. It's good to see you. Our phone numbers are there as well. You can call into the show if you have any questions. And uh, you just might, especially when it comes to giving away things that you thought you needed, but you really don't. We'll be right back. Always challenging the status quo. Hello, I'm Rod Bryant on Beyond the Matrix here at IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com. I want to encourage you to listen each week, every Wednesday at the same time, for an amazing show that will challenge you, inform you, and inspire. News, views, and wisdom for the nations. Here on IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com. Don't forget, Beyond the Matrix every week, Wednesday, here on IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com. Sovereignty, sovereignty, sovereignty. That's what the government is uh, saying they're going to start to implement coming July 1st. And our guest to talk about that is Nadia Matar. She is the co-chairwoman with Yehudit Katzover of the Women in Green and the Sovereignty Movement. She is very active. She's one of my heroes. And she's here on the show to talk to us about that. You can go and visit their website at womenandgreen.org and ribonut.co.il. Welcome to the show, Nadia Matar. Thank you, Tamar. Shalom to all the listeners. All right. So why don't you very briefly just start out and explain the difference between annexation and sovereignty? Very simple. Annexation is taking land that doesn't belong to you, that you take illegally away from another country, which is completely not the case in our situation. When we returned in 1967, after having been attacked by all the Arab countries, we returned 
to our land that belong to us according to the San Remo Conference, and I'm of course not even talking about according to the Bible, and God gave us this land, but even according to international law, there is no question here that this is not annexation. Anybody who uses the word annexation, basically somebody who oh, or doesn't know, uh, or is somebody who is against the uh, Jewish presence in Israel at all, or in Judea and Samaria, we have to use the term the application of Israeli sovereignty, because it is already ours. All we need to do is to apply Israeli rule, Israeli law, over this area, which should have been done the day we won the war in 67, but unfortunately at the time the government was so shocked by its victory and was so worried that we would have been erased off the map at the time that they didn't have a plan. And uh, 53 years later, with half a million Jews living in Judea and Samaria, we are saying that the time has come to finally implement what should have been done then. There is the application of Israeli law to once and for all make clear that between the sea and the Jordan River, there's only one sovereign national entity, the state of Israel. And that is uh, why it has to be called application of sovereignty and not annexation. All right. And so now that the government is finally saying that they're planning to... Uh, put sovereignty in these places. It's not going to be in the entire area of Judea and Samaria, not where the Arabs uh, are, but in the Israeli communities. And so what should we be doing now that the government says that we're going to make this move? Yeah, as an ideological movement, obviously, uh, uh, and who, we who are believers, we know that we have to apply sovereignty over the entire land of Israel. And we even uh, planned uh, and formulated a plan of how this should be done, a national outline plan, uh, uh, how it should be done, how we should bring another two million Jews here, how we should uh, b- build new communities, and how we should include the non-Jews who are here, uh, uh, and we can't uh, uh, deny that. But all this, is, we also have to be a little bit of a realist, and we have to know that Bibi Netanyahu is not going to do that at the very first step. And therefore, people ask us exactly what you ask, what should be done now with a government that is not so right-wing anymore, unfortunately, a unity government with the blue and white, and also with this deal of the century that is hanging over our head, in which, unfortunately, we are committed to apply sovereignty only if we, only if we agree to the creation of a Palestinian state. So which, of course, we completely uh, oppose uh, this linkage. And uh, our message, therefore, is in the difficult uh, political constellation with blue and white that is uh, done today, uh, um, we, there's still a way of, of, of something that could be done, and that is the following. What we're calling about, uh, upon our prime minister is to apply sovereignty to as much as you can, to as much that is in the consensus, as long as you don't link it to the deal of the century, as long as you don't link it to any promise to even discuss the idea of a Palestinian state, as long as you uh, uh, don't make any compromises on anything else, apply sovereignty to what is uh, uh, in the consensus with the government that you have now, And uh, when there will be upcoming elections afterwards and the right will win, please God, we will continue. Meaning it should be seen as a first step. Whether it's Jordan Valley first, or whether it's more, which we hope, uh, again, we want everything. But we understand that in this current constellation, everything uh, is not realistic. As long as uh, 70 is done, there's an expression in uh, Hebrew that says, open the door with a little needle. And then God will help you to open it much wider, meaning the little needle, just with a little needle, start with that. The needle is the first step, as long as we don't link it to anything bad. And then, please God, it will be just the first step for much more. And so can you explain to our listeners what exactly it means after we would apply sovereignty, because there are many people who are living in Judea and Samaria today, Israeli citizens in the Jewish communities, who see Israeli law here on a day-to-day basis. I mean, you'll see, you call the police, the police will come. Um, yeah. You know, we, we have to pay taxes just like everybody else. We're, we're basically, basically the same. What, what difference on the ground is it really going to make? Okay, there's two differences. First of all, before we get to the ground, it's on the international level and the national level in the consciousness. It will finally be a message that this is ours. Because as long as we don't apply sovereignty, basically the world is correct in saying, if you don't apply sovereignty and don't include this in, as part of the state of Israel, it's the Judea and Samaria uh, it has a different status than Ranana, Beersheba, Haifa, that means it's not yours and you're occupiers. So that's 
for me, the most important thing is for once and for all to declare it's ours and there's never, ever going to be a chance that this is going to turn into a Palestinian state. But for the, little, for the other level, as that you mentioned, there's also going to be a difference because, I don't know if people know, but the half a million Jews who live in Judea and Samaria, we all have the same obligations, that's true, but we don't have the same rights. We are under military rule. If my cousin from Ramat Gan and I want to add a second floor to our house, for instance, she will be able to go to the uh, architect and the uh, municipality and get her the okay. She can start building. I, as a resident, you, Tamar, as a resident of Judea and Samaria, we still have to have an additional signature of the Minister of Defense. Our Prime Minister here for half a million Jews is the, mili- is the military, the, 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 the Minister of Defense. So it's like uh, uh, very funny that people talk about human rights, but we are a second second class uh, uh, resident citizen in the sense that we are we don't have all the same rights. And I can I, I, I would be able to name you a lot of pregnant women who in Tel Aviv or in, in, within the little Israel have a certain amount of vacation after they they give birth that doesn't exist here in Judea and Samaria, and on and on many many laws that. Uh, uh, are against the the, the, the the Jewish residents, and uh, it would it would finally give us the same status as my cousin in Ramat Gan in Tel Aviv. But again, I'm not fighting for sovereignty because I want more rights. It's much more for the uh, uh, for the principle and for the ideological uh, uh, um, part of it that finally this will be part of the state of Israel officially. What about the uh, question about what's going to happen to the Arab uh, villages that are in Judea and Samaria? Now, we know that Israeli law, at at least at this point, is not going to be applied over them. But as you said before, that in Donald Trump's peace plan, he wants to make a Palestinian state. And the the, um, Arabs in the PA have threatened that they're going to open up uh, like a fourth intifada against us if we dare to apply sovereignty. I have news for you, okay? We, we who live in Judea and Samaria, we're in touch with the, the local Arabs. And they curse the day that the Oslo architects uh, uh, created this Oslo plan and uh, created the Palestinian Authority, where, in fact, they took outside terrorists and imposed them as leaders on the local Arabs. And before the, those uh, uh, Oslo Arabs who were imported from outside uh, uh, did terror against Jews. They first did terror against the local Arabs. I will never forget the neighbors here, my Arab neighbor, Walid, from uh, Vadidnis, who used to see me demonstrating with women in green against the Oslo Accords, and he told me, I'm talking about 1993, 94, he told me, may you be successful, because if you don't stop the Oslo Agreement, my village, Vadidnis, is going to be Area B, and I'm going to have to be under the, no more under the IDF, but I'm going to be under the terrible, corrupt terrorist leaders that you, your crazy Oslo architects are bringing and forcing upon. So I have news for people. People, the local Arabs don't want a, a, a Palestinian state. They tell us rightfully, rightly in the face, without a camera, because many of them don't dare. Some of them dare to talk to the camera, just to interview Bassem Eid and Sheikh Tamimi from Ramallah and Sheikh Jabri from Hebron, they, who are courageous enough to say it's following. We prefer residency under Israeli sovereignty rather than citizenship in a Palestinian corrupt terrorist state. And that is the majority of what the Arabs want here. And, the, and in the end, that's what's going to happen when we are going to, and that's, it's going to happen, whether it's in a few months or a year or two or more, there's going to be Israeli sovereignty over between the sea and the Jordan River. And the 1.8 million Arabs who live here will have to choose. Those who want to live with us in peace will have to accept residency with later a path to citizenship for the, for the few who will want to. Uh, but as I told you, the majority wants residency, like in Jerusalem. It's going to be like in Jerusalem. 300,000 Arabs in Jerusalem don't have citizenship. They have residency, and that's enough for them. They're going to have local municipal autonomy under Israeli sovereignty. Those who want to have an Arab, uh, live in an Arab country, we'll, we will help them to leave. And those who want to fight us as terrorists, well, uh, we have a strong army. And I'm telling you that that is the one and only plan that will bring stability and prosperity for all. A Jewish, large Jewish majority of Jews uh, uh, with a, a, a small non-Jewish minority loyal to the state of Israel. That's the correct sovereignty to be applied. Woohoo! Nadia for Prime Minister. We love it. We love it. And you will bring a real, true peace and cooperation I, here I in the Middle East. I want to give credit to my... Uh 
to my co-chair and my mentor, Judith Katzover, for being the one who's been pr promoting this and pushing this. And I have the big uh, privilege of being her student, and that's how I see it. And she's the brain behind it all. All right, very good. Well, she will be number one in your cabinet. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This is wonderful to hear this. And it's wonderful to hear that there are Arabs who are waking up and going past their hate and wanting to live in peace with the Jewish people. It's wonderful news to hear. If I have one more sentence, if you allow me. I have 10 seconds, Nadia, literally. According to the Trump plan, Arabs from the Galil were supposed to be transferred to the Palestinian state, and they were the first one to demonstrate against us. We want to stay under Israeli rule. Wonderful to hear. All right, everybody, you've heard it. Go to their website, and uh, it's called rebonute.co.il. We will link to that on the page where the show is podcasted. Nadia Matar, thank you so much for being shalom, with us. Shalom. God bless you and all that you do. Amen. When we get back, we're going to be talking about decluttering. If you're moving to Israel, you gotta, you're going to have to get rid of a lot of things. Um, she's going to teach us how to do it. And for the rest of us, just how to make, not do a bless this mess. Shalom, everybody. Making a difference often takes just one moment and one person at a time. I am Orly Benny Davis, your show host on Israel News Talk Radios from Jerusalem with love. You'll be hearing people talking about politics, religion, social issues, and making a better tomorrow. Join me, Orly Benny Davis, for God and Country. From Jerusalem with love. Wednesdays on Israel News Talk Radio. Well, with all what's happening in the news today, a lot of Jews who are living in the diaspora are really considering now coming home, moving to Israel. And especially if you're coming from a Western country, which, which is very affluent, and you've been able to purchase, you've been blessed to be able to purchase or live in a very large home, and you have so many things things and you're thinking, wow, I'm going to need to downsize if I go and move to Israel because if I move to Israel, most likely I'm going to be in a much smaller place. And what do I do with all of my stuff? And unfortunately, our stuff is keeping us in a golden cage. We're not able to extricate ourselves from all of our material things because where will we put it? So in order to help us free ourselves from this, as I said, this golden cage that we're in because of our stuff, we have with us Rebecca Saltzman as our guest. Rebecca moved to Israel six years ago with her husband and three children from New York. She holds a degree in fashion design from Parsons School of Design, and she's been helping people declutter in one form or another for over 20 years. She heads and runs an expert personal organization company, and she teaches people how to downsize and organize their homes. She has a growing online presence through her Facebook group called Organizing in Israel. You're all invited to go there and, and uh, put an application to join that group, Organizing in Israel. And she has a weekly podcast called Journey to Organization, where she talks about decluttering and reducing waste. She also runs an online decluttering challenge called Conquer Your Clutter. You can visit her website at balaganbegone.com. We will link to that on our page where the show is podcasted. Balagan in Hebrew means like a mess, something that's unorganized. So welcome to the show, Rebecca Saltzman. Thanks so much for having me. I'm so glad to be here. Very, very good to have you on. So uh, I want to, you know, I know that uh, this is a general topic that anybody everywhere can use, but I want to really uh, focus on people who are moving, especially to Israel, moving from a big place to a smaller place. I Let me just give you an example very quickly. There is someone I know whose mother is thinking about making Aliyah, her mother is an artist, and her mother has uh, maybe a, a few hundred 
paintings on canvases that she doesn't want to throw out, but there, there would be no way that she can bring these things to Israel. Where is she going to store them? Where is she going to put them? People have to downsize. People have to part from things that either A, they love, or B, think that they can't do without. How would you, as a, a counselor in this area, um, what would you advise them to do? So life is full of trade-offs, you know. Sometimes in order to get one thing that we want, we have to trade something else that we want. I have worked with artists before who have made Aliyah. Many of them do bring their paintings and and artwork or sculptures with them and do put them in storage. But, uh, you know, we have to sometimes think about what is the long-term consequence of storage in that situation. Like, are ultimately these paintings going to be sold? Like, what are your children going to do with them in the long run? That kind of thing. So sometimes letting go of things right now solves a problem that, you know, your next of kin will deal with after you have departed from this world. So at least if you do it right now yourself, you're going to do it in a way that is comfortable for you and, you know, makes sense to you. Uh, that being said, so many people have so much stuff that is not that important to them, and downsizing is really, like, a great option, and it forces us to look at the objects that we have in our life and curate the best collection of stuff that we have. And then, you know, we move to Israel or we move anywhere, and we're starting off in this new life with sort of these pieces that we feel are the best, are going to give us the best life. And I think that's a great way to start a new life in a new place, all fresh. Okay, so if I were to come to you and I live in a big uh, two-story house in the United States, I've got a garage filled with things, I have a, a, a storage room in my backyard where I store things, and now I decide, wow, you know, me and the hubby and the kids, we're going to be moving to Israel, we're going to be moving to a small three-bedroom apartment, um, I have to get rid of stuff, and, and everything is important to me. Where, where would you, how would you, what tips would you give me to start? Okay, so the first thing I would say is, well, obviously you can't take everything with you. I mean, you could, but then when you would get here, you would have to prioritize what would fit into your house. The biggest problem, I think, for most people who are making aliyah is they don't always know where their final destination in Israel is going to be. They move here going to a temporary place without having, like, a more permanent, like, residential solution. Uh, either they're in the process of buying a house or they want to rent someplace for, like, a year, and then they're going to buy a house. Uh, and so so you, they, they want to do something for this temporary, like, they don't want to leave everything behind, but they definitely want to you know, bring stuff because there's a lot of fear involving the unknown. Like, do I need it? I might need it. And like this worry can paralyze people and it's really terrible. So what I always suggest people do is definitely start with the things that are a must have for you. So if there's something that's going to make it feel like home to you, you should definitely bring that. Bring the things, start with the things that you love. And then after that, after you've curated your best, you know, 30, 40 pieces of, you know, furniture or, uh, you know, uh, clothing or kitchenware, like pick your best pieces that you absolutely can't live without, then you can go through these secondary items that are less important and start to weed out more critically and with a with a better eye for saying like I could live without this or I if I need it again I can always get it in Israel because believe it or not we do actually have stores here and you can buy things in Israel it's amazing <laughs> okay so if I were to go through my house what would the first thing you would tell me to do do I go from do I do room by room or do I do item by item like I would start first we're going to do shoes everybody get your shoes out or do we do it room by room? So I like to actually go person by person because I actually feel that like to say, okay, everybody bring your shoes into the living room is like too much. If everybody is going through their individual things, obviously small kids uh, need help. Even bigger kids sometimes need help. And sometimes our partners need help too. Uh, and just going through it with a partner is helpful. Um, but I feel like going through 
each person's space, person by person, and things that are communal, like making these decisions together as a family. But I, I like the space by the sort of room by room, person by person aspect, because I feel like it gives you some organized structure on how to actually start decluttering, uh, and it allows you to sort of see what you have in that particular category. Whereas if you if you went through it like everybody's shoes all at once, let's say, you wouldn't really get this idea of exactly how many pairs each person has. It's more like, wow, we had 150 pairs of shoes and now we have, you know, 50, but it might not be a balanced ratio between who has what. So I definitely think person by person and sticking to categories within that personal structure. And then when you're getting to areas that are common spaces like the living room or the kitchen, um, again, using the category structure is is a good idea. So if you keep kosher, you know, meat pots, then dairy pots, then parf pots. If you don't keep kosher, then it's just like do your pots, do your pans, do your dishes, do your glasses, and then start to downsize category by category. Okay, so um, how do we know what you, you talked about, you know, one of the piles you make is like must-haves. Do we do piles? Do we, do we go through a bedroom? Let's say we go through our bedroom, right? Do, do right. we like have piles? Okay, this is the must-have. This is the giveaway. This, how do we do it? So I always, I always like to take everything out and then decide like piece by piece, is it going or is it staying? And a lot of times you can look at things like more critically when you can actually see how much is in one space. So I always tell people, make sure the laundry is done when you're going through your clothing, let's say, and, and put it all together in one like heap. This way you can really see like, I have this many shirts, I have this many pairs of pants, I have this many, you know, sweaters. And when you can see how many you have in each category, you can really see the abundance that you've been blessed with. And what I also like to tell people is, like, we've been blessed with this sort of abundance in our lives. And sometimes it's too much. And when we have too much, we, can't, we need to let go of something so we can make room for new things to come to us. And I feel like that's part of a really successful Aliyah or any move in general is that when we can downsize the things that are no longer serving us anymore, uh, we, can, we can say, like, okay, I'm allowing space for new and better things to come into my life. So when, when we, you know, take it all out and, and put it all together, we can really see how much we have, and that makes a huge difference because it, it seems like a lot, and it probably is a lot for most people. And when you see that, it makes it clear that there is too much and much of what you have is not being used. So when you are able to get rid of things and realize that you are passing on the blessing to someone else, I think that's really, really huge. And it makes letting go of things a lot, a lot easier. Okay, so we're going to a break right now, but when we get back, I have a lot of questions for her, and uh, if you have any questions, feel free to call in yourself and ask them. I want to ask, what's the criteria for deciding whether you need it or not? Is it that if you haven't worn it for a year, give it away? What do you do with a stubborn person who says, I need everything? And uh, it, Maybe it's easier just to take what you want, fill up whatever you're allowed to fill up, and then that, the rest, you just got to leave it. I don't know. We'll ask some of these questions when we get back. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. This is Shai Bentico, and each week I'll be webcasting to you from Judea, origin of the word Jew, a people besieged and beleaguered in every generation. Nazi Germany is but a memory, but in its place the world invented the phantom Palestinians as this generation's internationally authorized Jew killers. Tune in for a different slant on life in Israel, Phantom Nation, every Monday. Hi, I'm Rabbi David Aaron. The soul basics are the most profound, the most essential, and yet often the most neglected in our education. Join me for Soul Talk on Israel's News Talk Radio and discover the secrets to love, spiritual growth, and personal power.
All right, we're back here at the Tamar Yona Show on IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com, and we're speaking with Rebecca Saltzman from BalaganBegone.com, and you can find her on Facebook uh, in a Facebook group called Organizing in Israel. And she's talking to us about decluttering. Everybody in the world can get some advice from this show, but especially if you're thinking about making Aliyah and you have to start to downsize, you have to decide what you're going to bring to Israel with you if you're moving here and what you're not. Uh, You're going to want to listen to the show and you're going to want to follow Rebecca Saltzman on her Facebook page and on her website. And also she offers classes as well, uh, online classes. You'll want to look into that as well. So, Rebecca, I had some questions before the last break, and that is what happens, very briefly, if you can just answer, what happens if you're working with somebody, uh, you have to help them declutter, if whether it's a husband or, or a wife or, a, or a, a kid, and they're stubborn. They say, no, I need everything. So if that's the case, then they could probably be a hoarder and they need, like, real help, but... Uh, like psychological help, and they need to work with a psychiatrist. But for people who are like what I like to call like level one or level two hoarders, where they're just feeling like insecure about being without the stuff because they've had it for so long, to those people I say, again, it's about the choice. Like you're giving up one thing to gain something else. So I force everybody to take like a hard look at everything that they have. Most of the time when people are stuck with certain objects that they can't get rid of, it's because they don't really know how to categorize it in their minds. They think that it's going to be useful to them, but it's not really. So it's okay to just say like, thank you for this and I'm going to let it go. And somebody... Okay. Uh, I think that we lost our guest, so I'm going to talk until we can try to get her back on the line. Um, you know, for me, I, I, I'm one of these people also, I don't like to let go of things if, because one day I might need it, and if I have the room to store it, I, I try to. But, uh, okay, I think we got her back on the line. Rebecca, so you were I'm saying. Here. I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, can you repeat the question again, Tamar, please? Well, I was, I was saying that if you're working with someone who's stubborn, they think that they need everything. Right. So for those people, again, they, they don't need everything. So it's just about gently reminding them, you know, what is the priority? If you live with someone who is like that, it's really important that you declutter in a pair or get a pro to help you because... Um, they have trouble making those kind of decisions on their own, so they need somebody to force them to make a decision. So uh, if that's your spouse, then you need to stand there with them and say, what about this one, what about this one, and force them to make a decision, keep or toss. But a good way to really start with people who are like that is to set limits before you even start with them. So make a limit. How many shirts are you bringing? How many pots are you bringing? How many, you know, boxes of files are you going to bring? Whatever it is, set these limits before you start decluttering in that section. And that's really going to help them because it helps them understand like how much is actually possible to bring and take. That's a great idea. Because I was going to say also like just, you know, here's your suitcases and here's you have two boxes to fill, take what you want. And once those boxes exactly. are filled, that's it. Okay. And, and what's the criteria? You know, they say that for clothes, if you haven't worn it in a year or, or something, and then then you don't need it, and you should give it away. But what do you say? What's your criteria for giving something away? So I feel like if you haven't worn it, that's a really good indicator. But a lot of people, especially women, uh, especially in the like 25 to 45 demographic, they're pregnant, they're nursing, they're fluctuating their weight a lot. And so they're saying to me, well, I don't want to give up these really great clothes. So I always say to them, pick the best pieces that you possibly can, like pick the 10 best pieces. And again, set a number, set some targets for yourself, pick these best pieces for yourself. And then you can store like these small, like micro collections of clothes that if you had to replace would be really expensive to do that. Um, And then you can go from there. So like, as long as you're willing to get rid of like a big portion of what you have, especially if you think you won't have the space and because you probably have limited capacity in what you could actually bring, um, then it'll be easier to deal with fluctuating sizes. But overall, in general, I find that like anything that you don't love the way it looks on you, regardless of when the last time you wore it, uh, because you're not going to feel great in it. And that's the point of clothes, to feel great in what you're wearing. So anything that you haven't worn in a year is a great way to start, but anything that's ripped or torn or that you just don't love the way it looks or the way it feels or the quality of it or how it's aged over time. 
Okay. And so uh, give us some now tips. Let's say that I come to you. I say, uh, Rebecca, we're moving. I need help. What do I do? What, what are you going to tell okay. me? So what we would do is go, we would go room by room and we would start decluttering room by room. But the thing, the most important thing is, especially when you're moving or making Aliyah, it's to actually work backwards from your moving date. So you can figure out like, what your timeline is and make sure you have everything done before uh, the movers actually get there because you don't want to be standing over the movers and saying like, oh, no, that's not going. And you don't want the movers to actually pack like, I've had movers pack like bowls of fruit that were on table and then they get people get to Israel and they have like fruit flies and rotten fruit all over the place and it stinks, right? Because you want to, so you want to work backwards from, the date of your move, so you can slowly pace yourself with the decluttering. And then what you want to do is you want to sort of go room by room, and you want to start with the things that are non-essential. So I always advise people to pack, like, books and entertainment items first because that's a great way. Those, that task is really onerous to go through all your books, and it's, it's okay. You can usually live without your books for a few weeks, and so I always tell people, start with these, like, lower-impact items that you're not going to miss as much and, and go through those, but then go through room to room. So if that means the garage, there's supplies, there's tools, it's not a good idea to bring tools that are power tools that you need to run on a transformer because it's not really practical to run most of these tools on a transformer. The same thing in the kitchen. Bringing tools that are, like, stationary in one place that were super expensive, like, for example, a Vitamix blender, those are okay to bring with a transformer, but I don't suggest people bring, like, lower-cost items that are easy to get in Israel, like a toaster or a microwave. Those kind of things don't make sense to run on a transformer. When you move into the bathroom, you want to look at things like blow dryers and straighteners. Those kind of things are also not good to run on a transformer. So... Those are the kind of things you want to sell, and you can put the money aside and use it to buy things here in Israel or the, with the correct voltage. But mostly when you're going through room by room, you have to consider the smaller space that you're most likely going to be moving into because there's just probably not going to be as much room uh, as there was in your home anywhere outside of Israel. And so going through and, again, making these targets and saying, like, what is essential to me and what is not essential to me? And when you take things out of cabinets and you can really see what you have, it makes it easier to decide what is an essential piece and what is not an essential piece. And how do people work with you online? I mean, you're not going to be going to their houses. You're here in Israel and people are in the States. How do you work with them online? So I do actually go to America and work with people. Um, and I do help people unpack here in Israel. But I actually have this program called Done in a Day Declutter, which is really, really successful. And what I do is we walk through, we make a plan for the morning, and then we go through the day and we have check-in points at every 30 minutes. And I give you, like, these specific tasks to help you declutter specific spaces. And it's really very successful for people because what they really just need is some accountability while they're decluttering. And I think that's what this program offers, which makes it so successful, is because I'm telling you exactly what to do. I'm checking in with you at a 35 or, or 60 minute interval, and and you have to report back to me and show me what you've done. So it really, really helps people declutter uh, and makes a huge difference in their lives. And you can do this online? Yeah, totally online. Hmm. Interesting. We just use WhatsApp uh, what's that video and it's really it's super easy and, and simple and have you ever really had like a it. client that just couldn't do it uh yeah in those situations i tell them either to work with a partner or i tell them they have to have a pro in-house hmm. interesting it, it's 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 very interesting because it's so hard for some people to let go of their stuff you know and people will be paying money to put their stuff in storage places and then they never even see them again and they just keep paying and paying and paying it's crazy it's it is a little crazy but but the thing is is when you're working with a pro and you put money into the process it actually helps people declutter because they're like well i'm paying for this service and you know i want to get my money's worth mm. Right. Very good point. All right. So uh, we have like another 60 seconds left. What do you want to leave us with? 
I, it's not, if you are one of those people who, you know, feels like you're in a hopeless situation, it's not hopeless. There is definitely ways you can crawl out from under your clutter. Just seek help. There are loads of people who can give you help if you don't, you know. Uh, but I'm here for you, and you can join the Organizing in Israel group, and uh, we're happy to support all people making Aliyah and not making Aliyah. Very good. All right. And I, and I would go for what you said. Just take whatever, you know, you decide 10 shirts, to, uh, whatever the, the number is. Probably, I, I don't even know how to decide. It should be 10 shirts, 6 shirts, 16 shirts. Who knows? But I usually we'll, like to say enough for two weeks. Ah, okay. That's a good tip. Enough for two yeah. weeks. Okay. Two weeks so it can go to laundry, et cetera, et cetera, and you sell exactly. variety. All right. Well, I want to thank you so much, Re- Rebecca Saltzman, for joining us on the show. For anybody who needs more help, you can go to her website, Balagan Be Gone. We'll link to that on the page where the show is podcasted. You can find her on Facebook as well. Tell her that you heard the show. She'll be thrilled to hear that. And uh, good luck in sizing down and decluttering and making your house more livable, more breathable, and your your own life more organized. Thank you so much, Rebecca Salzman, for being with us. Thank you for having me. And thank you, everybody else, for being with us. If you have any comments or questions, feel free to write me. Tamar, T-A-M-A-R, at IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com. Wow, I I feel a little inspired to go into my closet, try to tackle that. We'll win that war. Israel News Talk Radio's chat room. Just click the orange button at the top of the IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com page, log in as yourself or an anonymous guest, and join in on the fun. You'll meet other listeners from all over the world who listen to Israel News Talk Radio, and you can make new friends. Israel News Talk Radio's chat room. It's the closest you can get to being in the studio with us. We love listening to Israel News Talk Radio. Where can you get the inside news on Israel? At Israel News Talk Radio, we're dedicated to sharing Israel's inside story with the world by providing our listeners with news on Israeli politics, current affairs, and Israeli Jewish culture. The Israel News Talk Radio homepage also provides you, the listener, with useful information at your fingertips with scrolling news headlines, weather, currency exchange, Shabbat candle lighting times, and so much more. Our radio programming is always accessible and on demand. We operate absolutely free of charge for everyone, everywhere. If you love what we do, partner with us now by becoming an Israel News Talk Radio supporter. With your support, you'll be inscribed on our Israel News Talk Radio Wall of Fame. There's nothing like us in the world. Be part of something great. Israel News Talk Radio. Straight talk from Israel. If you love Israel News Talk Radio, then you'll love our Facebook page. We keep you up to date on what's happening in Israel, plus little surprise treasures that we don't share on the radio. Go now to follow us on Facebook. Just look for the Israel News Talk Radio Facebook page. And don't forget to subscribe and follow us by clicking on the like button. We post great stuff there that you'll want to share. Israel News Talk Radio on Facebook and Israel News Radio on Twitter. News, opinion, and more. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio.